Today is the day when our Christian kin celebrate love's defeat of death in the story of the resurrected Christ. This is the time of year when our pagan kin celebrate the return of spring, the beginning of the zodiac calendar and fertility. This is the time of year where in a few weeks, when Passover comes, our Jewish kin are preparing to recall that the safety found in community and in their God is the beginning of the Freedom Road. And by the way, I want to make a quick aside to highlight the word that I'm using, kin. It's intentionally non-gendered. Saying our Christian brothers and sisters leaves out all those beautiful gender-neutral questioning in our queer Christians. And Ken also claims that we're family, interlinked, not just friends that can be dropped. So when I say Ken, I'm not trying to be cute or a bumpkin. <laughs> I am aiming for living into our principles of personal dignity and existential interconnection. Because if we are celebrating the renewal of life and we are universalists, which we are, most of us, then we are celebrating the renewal of all life. Even tall people. <laughs> I wouldn't know. I imagine sometimes it's hard to be tall. <laughs> but of course, life is as dynamic and complex as it is diverse and beautiful. And in fact, the more I think about it, the less distinct the word life and the word dynamic become. Life is dynamism, so we will celebrate this dynamism in all its diversity in our flower communion in a few moments. But before we do, I think it is important to note that dynamism means change. And so now maybe life means change. For without change, of course, there is no dynamism. Without change, there is no life. There's just this great glob of unmoving being, an ontological traffic jam. But we have been graced to be in a changing universe where life is made possible on this precious Goldilocks blue earth. Of course, there is a irony here. And the beautiful and tragic irony is that change is hard. <laughs> change is life and also because of that, in a sense, every change, right? Every change is a death of what was. So the irony is that life is change and change is death. And so transitive math tells us that that means that life is death. And if that pill is too big, we can at least understand that life as we know it is assured by death, right? This, is, this was brought up in the story earlier today, not by me. <laughs> that we recycle, that we're part of a cycle, that in some way we all eat each other. <laughs> Which does remind me of the Last Supper, really. And in fact, that there is death in life and, and, and life through death sounds a bit like Easter. It does to me. I mean, this Easter story, it's the climax of the Gospels, and, and it's been read rather fatalistically and literally, literarily, actually, in, in most, most Christian understandings. Um, and what I mean by that is, in those understandings, everyone knows the end of the story before the story begins. Right? We all know that Jesus dies in 
is resurrected, however you want to think about that, but we know that's the end of the story, and we know that when the story begins. We read everything with, in that shadow or in that refracted light. And so in that sense, Jesus had to die. He had to die to demonstrate literarily, not politically, literarily he had to die. Maybe theologically he had to die to demonstrate the ultimate victory. Life moving through and beyond death. And, and that's not such a different story than the one that I've been ruminating on at the beginning of this reflection. Life and death are inseparable. The angel of death is the angel of life. And when it comes to life, all life, mine, yours, our ancestors and offspring, our pets and pests, plants, microbes, hookworms and bookworms, there is no perpetuation of that life without renewal, and that means a cycle. So, so you may read that in many different ways and in, on different scales. Renewal may be, for you, the renewal of life just metaphorically. It might be the renewal of your life as you reinvent yourself as you, as you grow. Or it might mean reincarnation, quite specifically. Or it might mean the recycling of your material while your soul moves on or desists. Whatever your understanding, today as we celebrate spring and the renewal of life, we acknowledge that this day and this body and this life are just a point on the circle. As we celebrate that, that point, so too must we honor the whole circle, the circle of life. Now, you'll be glad to know that your worship leadership are not so cheesy as to title a reflection, The Circle of Life, and then have you sing the Elton John song. <laughs> we considered it. <laughs> I thought about it. And your beloved music director looked at me in such a way that I thought better of it. But I will tell you a story about Elton John and an Episcopalian priest. So when I was in seminary, I was taking a class on the history of the church, of the Christian church. My professor for that class was an Episcopalian priest, Episcopal priest. And he told a story about how one time he was doing a memorial service for one of his congregants. And she said, okay, at the memorial service, well, for the spouse of one of his congregants. And she said that at this memorial service, he had to play The Circle of Life by Elton John. And he was in a quandary because he wanted to honor this woman's wishes, this woman we love. But that is not Christian theology. So he could not figure out what to do in this instance. I don't remember how he resolved the thing, but I just remember that the circle of life is not, the Christian story ends with uh, salvation. I mean, you go, you go to God, right? You don't cycle through, it has an end. It may be an eternally felt ending, but it's not the cycle anymore, right? So he had, he had a bit of a problem. We don't have that problem. <laughs> Not that I recommend anybody asking me to play that song at a memorial service, but okay, you know, I will if you want me to. <laughs> it's just a matter of taste with me, not theology, actually. So um, at any rate, the, you know, the story, this story that the priest was telling me it does wind up being words about salvation. In non-universalist Christian traditions, there's this idea you die, and, and if you're one of the popular kids, you're saved. <laughs> That's the end. There's no circle or cycle. Salvation is the end of the, of the game. But that is not our idea of salvation. Our idea of salvation has evolved over the centuries and has its roots in our universalist heritage. You see, the universalists came along and said that salvation is not just for the cool kids. It's for everyone. It's universal, hence the name. What's more, as the universalists evolved to an everlasting dogmatic tradition, they were able to be open-minded. And so instead of only being about the afterlife, salvation widened in scope to be about all life. Free from dogma, salvation shifted from an afterlife possibility to a present-day struggle. 
Salvation came to be about socioeconomic situations and systems and the current state of your spirit and character. This critical thread of our tradition continues to evolve and is alive and well today in our first principle. That everyone is saved has evolved into the principle that everyone is born with inherent worth and dignity. That dignity and diversity are represented in the flowers that we share here today, symbolically, each stem and bloom adding to the bouquet. Now, this principle, by the way, is not a creed or dogma. It is, I consider it anyway, an aspiration. It's an aspiration. It's something that calls to us. And it's grounded and actualized by none other than faith. So you may think faith is a flimsy ground. But I have come to believe that faith is critical to the processes of awakening critical to the process in this vocabulary of salvation. So I have been working on a litany of salvation, and I would like to review that for a moment. Salvation, as I see it, is the experience of being freed from fear. This does not mean that fear is eliminated from the world. It means that you are not hooked by it. You are free from it. You do not live in its thrall. That freedom is found in our ability to respond rather than react. If you are reacting, you are automatic and you are not free. So freedom is found in responsibility. We cultivate that responsibility over reactivity when we pay attention mostly to ourselves, to how we are perceiving and reacting until we are no longer beholden to that reaction. <clears throat> Meanwhile, freedom comes from fearlessness and fearlessness comes from faith and faith is a story that guides our ability to respond, which is where we find freedom. So what is our story that we have faith in that leads to our freedom? It is this. Our story bears witness to the notion that we are all interconnected. That everything is interconnected and that we, each of us, are bestowed with inherent worth and dignity. That each and every one of us is invited all the time. Invited and able to live without fear and so find freedom. Now given that Christianity is one of our sources, a primary source, in fact. That story, our story, is informed by the story of Easter, the story of Christ's resurrection, and what that says about life and death and salvation. Our story also comes from the older traditions of the earth that celebrate the wheel of the year and the cyclicality and indomitability of life itself. So today we celebrate the spring and we celebrate the Easter story and the promises they instill in us. We celebrate not the resurrection necessarily of a person, but the dissemination of a radical kind of personhood filled with a fear dispelling worth and dignity. Today we celebrate the renewing power of life that flows through our hearts and is embodied by our faith. Our faith, our story housed in our bodies and in this institution that our bodies build. As an institution, it is a gathering of dignitaries of the spirit. <laughs> Not everyone has to agree. I think it means <laughs> that it is a gathering of dignitaries of the spirit, a perpetuation of that dignity, a house whose duration is assured by our commitment and whose view is unto the generations. 
And so we here plug into a kind of being big enough to encompass a larger swath of that cycle of life. Here as the desert turns again to spring, here in this country who needs our love so badly, here on this planet whose particular grace gives us a chance to be.